In this video clip, I'm going to talk about some topics from Chapter 4 in McClendon. This is a narrative chapter. We find that in his volume 1 of Ethics, in each of the three major divisions, the middle chapter is a narrative or biographical chapter. Uh, this relates to McClendon's uh, methodological approach by which he seeks to elucidate and examine theological convictions through narrative sources. In this case, of course, it's a story about uh, two um, early Massachusetts um, church people, one of them uh, very famous, and his wife, uh, Jonathan Edwards and Sarah Edwards. Uh, what McClendon finds interesting because of Edwards' theological writings about the nature of virtue and because of his writing about his relationship with Sarah is that there is a very helpful insight into the nature of the virtue of love in particular. And so the setting, of course, was in the 1730s, 1740s, this period in which Edwards was most active as a scholar and as a writer. Um, it's the period that we have often referred to historically as the Great Awakening. Edwards was a preacher in western Massachusetts. There was a growing difficulty among the uh, second, third generation of immigrants who had thought that they were coming to establish a kind of religious utopia uh, where the church would flourish because it was no longer under the um, domination of the crown and of the church hierarchy. And instead what they found was uh, while those willing to make the initial trip to the uh, new colonies certainly had a high degree of religious favor, fervor and devotion uh, that didn't necessarily last from generation to generation. And so uh, Edwards had ended up marrying the daughter of one of the leading uh, preachers of his day, Samuel Stoddard. And Stoddard had in trying to deal with this issue, initiated a proposal called uh, the Second, the Halfway Covenant. I was about to say second hand, but the Halfway Covenant. And the Halfway Covenant was a way to try to grapple with what Baptists would later uh, um, emphasize, uh, which is the need for conversion. Uh, and therefore, uh, baptism is something that follows conversion rather than uh, a practice uh, that is uh, performed on infants. And so what Stoddard's compromise solution was that uh, children would be baptized into the church, but there would also be a time of waiting for them to exhibit the signs of grace. Now, as if you know much about your Puritan history, uh, then you would recognize that uh, Puritans, while they were predestinarians, in other words, they believed that God had elected some to be saved and some to be damned, they also were always wondering who is which. And so they uh, began to develop these theories about how to recognize someone who had been predestined to grace. And so they looked for the marks of grace or the signs of grace in a person's life, and that would include a virtuous life, uh, that would um, uh, include a person's participation in the church. But uh, the Puritan divine John Cotton from the 1630s had proposed there was also... Um, something to look for uh, which was a sign of grace and that's what we might think of as a conversion. 
that is, that a person might demonstrate an experience of grace, that is, to have recognized their sinfulness and have felt sorrow for that and had longed for a way to uh, escape its uh, consequences and had come to have uh, a joyous uh, recognition of the grace of God in their lives. And so uh, Cotton was one of the first to kind of spell out what later became sort of the classic American form of Christianity, which was this idea of, of a conversion experience that shows certain signs. And, um, and so uh, Stoddard's Halfway Covenant then said, well, Halfway means um, you're part way in because you've been baptized an infant, but we also await the time that there would be a more uh, direct sign of grace through conversion and the awakening of religious um, affections, you know, of, of, of desire to serve God. So Jonathan Edwards was, uh, had replaced Samuel Stoddard out on. Uh, what to them was the western frontier, uh, sort of central Massachusetts. And there he was preaching in Northampton, and he was known as a great preacher, uh, but actually not necessarily in all the ways that we might imagine a great preacher. Certainly his sermons are considered classic literature, uh, but also... As far as his delivery, he wasn't uh, a fiery orator like, say, the other one of the other great preachers of the Awakening, uh, Whitfield from England. And um, in fact, they say that Edwards would just hold his um, manuscript in his hands and look down and read it in almost a monotone. And so, while we see some dramatic turns of phrase in his writing. His actual preaching wasn't uh, a particularly emotional thing. And so McClendon develops part of this story, which involves the fact that uh, Edwards was a preacher who was in demand. He had uh, influence in the colonies, and uh, he sometimes traveled. And when he traveled, then uh, there would be a guest preacher and... and um, in this particular case, he tells a story of that that Sarah tells about her own experience when Jonathan was gone, and Sarah um, receiving this guest preacher who was a younger man and perhaps more charismatic in certain ways uh, than her husband, and. Um, it was in a context in which, as any of you know about a church, there a preacher has his critics, and so there were those who were um, criticizing her husband, and um, certainly one of the things that we might observe is that the spouse of a minister often feels these criticisms very deeply, and so in a kind of an emotional state, uh, with this visiting preacher, um, Sarah has a kind of collapse. Perhaps uh, sometimes we might use a, a cliched term, a nervous breakdown, something that puts her to bed, an emotional experience. And uh, she's very troubled in thinking about this. And, and obviously over time, she and Jonathan talked this through very extensively. Um, but after some time in uh, uh, bed rest, uh, she, her description of, uh, of what happened was there was a, a moment of, of great um, peacefulness and joy and delight that came upon her in which she uh, felt and knew the grace of God in her life and the love of God and that she need not worry about any ideas that she might have had about the competition between these preachers or or about her um, husband's worthiness or her worthiness or whatever it might be. 
Um, as you know, there are many people who have analyzed this story, and McClendon went into those, and I'm not particularly interested in analyzing each of those. Um, but it's from this that McClendon develops the um, Edwards, and then McClendon develops this discussion about the virtue of love. And I've asked you all to do some work on that on a discussion board. Um, let me say a few more things to kind of wrap up uh, this uh, topic in the chapter. You know, the awakenings came even without Edwards as a fiery preacher. They came to Northampton first in 1734 and they began to spread. And so um, Edwards wrote about this uh, and how the, the awakening came unexpectedly and so the name of his writing was uh, a faithful narrative of the surprising work of God which is the way that awakenings and revivals were first understood. Nowadays, we sort of we schedule them, we try to make them happen, etc. Uh, but, but in these days, it was not a common experience and not something that had been expected. Um, and so the goal, of course, was to be visible saints. And a visible saint means someone who demonstrates that the grace of God has touched a person's life and the awakenings were a, a kind of revitalizing of that possibility which had been brought um, over by the Puritans as they settled in New England. Um, the concept of consent which plays a prominent role in Edwards uh, understanding of ethics is a uh, doesn't speak immediately to our common language, and that is, he's saying that the um, the response of the human, the response of the creature to the creator of the human to God, is ultimately a response of consent. It's an it's a willingness to receive the grace and the goodness of God that comes to us in many ways, through creation, through our own existence, um, through our fellow human beings, uh, through um, the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. We have received grace and our response to that is consent. It's to acknowledge and receive it. It's to say that this is, in fact, what is good for me. Um, one of the best ways to understand it, it comes from the tradition of uh, uh, gospel music, and that's a familiar chorus that you have probably sung many times. Uh, it says, I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes. I will trust you and obey when your spirit speaks to me. With my whole heart I'll agree. And my answer will be yes, Lord, yes. That, that yes response is our consent to the will of God, to the presence of God. It's, the, it's our consent to God's goodness that has come to us uh, in many manifold ways. And so, as Edwards comes to understand the, the love of God and the virtue of love, he comes to see that uh, what love is, is our consent to what God is doing through those whom God has sent us. And therefore, a key aspect of loving others is consenting to the goodness of God in them. And so, for Sarah... And Jonathan to love one another was to consent that they were God's gift to one another. Uh, it's love, therefore, of friendship, the love of marriage, the, the love of uh, parent and child, all the forms of love that we have, um, have within them this element of consent, of accepting the goodness of God that comes to us through God's creatures. Okay, that's enough on this chapter, and I'll provide some discussion on other topics as well.